Welcome to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast, addressing all aspects of the digital enterprise, inspiring connection without boundaries and creation without limits. Thank you for tuning in. Here are your hosts, Tom Singer and Craig Brown. Hey, hey, and welcome to, or welcome back to, the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Thank you very much for coming along on the journey of this podcast that is designed to be a resource for those who work in and around PLM. The Digital Enterprise Society is a forum for the exchange of ideas surrounding the tools, processes, and practices used across the product life cycle. To learn more, visit digitalenterprisesociety.org. My name is Tom Singer, and I have the honor to be the co-host of this show, along with Craig Brown an industry veteran and former PLM leader at General Motors. Hey, Craig, how are you today? I'm great, Tom. Good to hear you. Each week, we try to bring to this podcast interesting interviews and other ideas to help all of the listeners enhance and grow their careers. And today is going to be awesome. Today's guest is Peter Ballello. And Peter is the CEO and president of SimData, a strategic management consulting company in the area of PLM. Hey, Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to the chat we have today, and hopefully uh, there'll be quite a bit of learning coming from it. So, Peter, to get us started, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, sort of what you did to begin with in your career, and, and how you got to what you're doing today with SimData? Well, happy to do that. So, a little bit of background. I've been with the company now, SimData, which is a management consulting firm in the PLM space for a little over 22 years uh, before that, I actually was with General Motors within that uh, area and did a lot of work in the factory floor and then ended up in the engineering area, kind of started in data management, product data management, and then joined SimData to be a consultant in the area. And since then, been working with industrial companies around the world. Um, SimData is a boutique firms, but you know, kind of means I do a lot of work with a lot of different companies. And really, the application of PLM is quite interesting to me and how it can really impact almost any type of company, no matter if it's a financial firm to any kind of discrete manufacturing firm, process industry firm, and pretty much everything in between. A little bit about myself and kind of the application of PLM is what really excites me. Well, thanks, Peter. The, uh, you and I have, uh, we've, well, we've worked together for the last five or six years, as I recall. And um, before that, I used to be invited to speak at uh, a predecessor of yours, a company named CPDA. And what's been interesting these past 20 years is how much stuff has really changed. I mean, the application of computers for engineering have been uh, just phenomenal. And it's this thing that, that you know, gets me excited. Um, I was able to attend your conference back in, it's a roadmap, everybody, that, that's held once a year here in the States. Actually, it's held also over in the overseas. But um, you, you had a discussion about PLM's future and, and kind of had PLM run its course. Uh, share with us the key points from your, your speech back in May. So I think if I look at the PLM industry and you know been around it quite a number of years, it continues to evolve and expand, but at the same time, we're not doing a lot different than we did 20, 30 years ago. So as one of the things I talked about there was an outcome of a recent uh, survey that we did uh, looking at the status of PLM implementations. And it was quite interesting how the vast majority of people are still doing core, what I would call pro core product data management enablement. So engineering change management, engineering bomb management, those kind of traditional areas. Now, with that said, it's a little disappointing in that that's all we're still spending time on, but it is a foundational element. Those are foundational elements and it makes sense, but there's so much more that can be done. I mean, you kind of touched on it with computers today can do a lot, a lot more things and a lot more analysis more analytics and other things that just weren't available to us 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But we don't get the foundation right, good luck trying to do everything else with it. And then you have new concepts, or I would say broadened concepts, or new terminology like digital thread and digital twin, and then new application technologies like a blockchain, for example, or additive manufacturing, or AI in, in, you know, in augmented reality, and the list goes on and on, I think you get the point. But most of those things from a PLM context you have to have the foundation. That foundation is the data and process management. So one of the things I asked at that event was, okay, so we've been trying to do product lifecycle management now. It's kind of the term there kind of came out in the late 90s or so. So we're about 20 years into using that term. And I would argue, you know, lifecycle management's been around a lot longer than that. 
And we're still, though, kind of doing the same old stuff, or at least not getting much beyond that same old core areas. So I asked the question, you know, is PLM as a term, is it, is it passe? You know, is it time to renew the term so that people think differently and not just saying, oh, well, PLM is what we're doing already. It's still an engineering thing. It's still a data management thing, which is all true, but it's much more than that. And we're, we're just not seeing it as much as we would expect, given the fact that data management or product data management, which is the core, has been around from a commercial sense from at least the early 1980s. So we're in it for many years, but it's still somewhat frustrating that we haven't seen the, the broader sense of the pickup of life cycle from concept to end of life and the able, enablement from a broad and deep perspective. But the reality is that's where we're at. And there's a lot of opportunities, maybe challenges as well, of course, to get to that broader sense in more holistic manner that we would hope uh, that many companies, we know many companies need, hopefully they'll continue to strive for that. What, one of the things that digital enterprise societies uh, focused on is these medium and small size companies. And, and a lot of them seem to be a little further behind in this journey for PLM, unless they're a brand new company. And if they're a brand new company, well, then they come along and they kind of get something, install it and off they go. And all of a sudden they're a leader in the technology of tools instead of the follower. So I think part of this is um, when you started adopting PLM and then whether you're willing to adjust or move to the next generation. Um, one of the things that, that gets talked about a lot is uh, the changing trends. We, we didn't all have these phones that we hold that are now more powerful than the computers that landed on the moon. And yet now we expect to do everything with the phone. Um, tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what are the trends today and the potential disruptors and how might they influence PLM or even make it better? Yeah, there's a lot going on. It. You know, look at, look, talk a little bit about the small and mid-sized companies and what we're seeing in that area. One is there's a more willingness to try something. You know, larger companies, sometimes it's just the structure or the culture. They're less likely to try something new, but there also there's a lot of legacy, you know, legacy data, legacy systems, which quite frankly, it's difficult to go just rip and replace. So newer companies are more likely to you know, not have that and be able to attach themselves to a new capability more quickly for adoption. It also has a lot to do with the individuals in the company. This goes into some of the trends like social media or social savvy workers and their, their expectation of data access. So one you mentioned about the mobile phone and being able to access information, which is, uh, I'd say, much more easily recognizable and not, you know, just engineered. And I would say this, you, you, you look at some PLM solutions historically, and you could see the data model in the user interface. But mm -hmm. people are not, they're yeah, not used all, to that. It's overwhelming, right? <laughs> yeah, it's overwhelming. They're not used to that. They're used to looking at information, the newer people to industry, social savvy workers, you know, the millennials and others are saying, hey, I want to use information within the context of what I'm doing and the questions I'm asking. I don't want to have to understand the data model to go and get information. So a bunch of things are evolving, hopefully help that. Some of it's analytics. Uh, some of it is, you know, AI and using, you know, artificial intelligence or augmented reality type things that bring information into better context and better viewable context for people to, to understand it and make decisions on it. And also, I think the movement from files into more data, uh, mm -hmm. data representation can help do that and help bring data within context. Because, you know, we, we put these things into files and the file has may have a context, but information itself in the file could have con multiple contexts that sh it should be associated with. And it becomes really tricky when we, we create these systems that are very structured and really information needs to be fluid, mostly. Uh, when you get a definition, certainly in a baseline, that has to be very precise. But information itself, if you break that down, should be very fluid for people to be able to use in different contexts and understand the context for use. So I'm thinking that those are some of the things that are evolving. And I, I think the analytics space is quite interesting and the application of it uh, into understanding information can play a major role, not just into the unstructured information that we have more and more of. You think about lifecycle management today, many companies are trying to take data from the in-service product and make some sense out of that information set or that a lot of, lot of it unstructured information, maybe just what people are saying about my product, making sense out of it, bringing it back into earlier cycles of the life cycle and closing the loop and being able then to make better decisions moving forward. And analytics can make, play a major role in doing that. And then you get kind of the AI and some of the augmented reality or augmented intelligence 
uh, that can be built into the tools to help people along as well to make better decisions. That, I mean, it's just scratching the surface of some of the kind of key things that we see happening right now. So, so we know enough about this technology to, to trust it, but I wonder if we also uh, at times need to be able to challenge it, meaning challenge the way it's guiding me. Um, I, I'm a big fan of TurboTax. I, I use it a lot. On the other hand, um, I'm not so sure that in an engineering environment or an environment where we're inventing all the time, that you don't want to go back to the, the, if you will, the raw data, the raw test results, and, and ask yourself some other questions that maybe the AI system has now um, learned its way away from it. it do, you, do you think that's a risk that, that maybe the AI will be, make it, if you will, dumb it down too much so that people make decisions quickly, but maybe the inappropriate decisions? Well, there's a couple of things going on there. They're very interesting and, and valid point. One is, the AI is only as good as the people that developed it to begin with. I know, okay, maybe it's somewhat self-learning, but the reality is it's self-learning based upon algorithms that someone made as well. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's it's, we don't really have artificial intelligence. Uh, now, maybe, maybe in the future sometime, and you, you hear these guys say that somehow the machines are going to create themselves. Okay, maybe that's possible. That's certainly not where we're at today. So that's one limiting factor. The other thing that actually worries me more than even making decisions on that limiting let's say knowledge base or knowledge brought forward, is that we could dumb things down to the point where people aren't making or aren't taking the time to think about it themselves. Mm -hmm. So we can just be sitting there, maybe not engineers anymore almost, and just say, oh, well, I just, I, the system tells me that and I just go forward. And you ask them, well, why did the system make that decision? I have no idea, that's just what they it told me. And to me, that could dumb down things even further where people aren't able to be innovative. Because I think ultimately that's what we want, right? Innovation and process and product and, and other things are wrap, wrapped around it. But that requires people to have that clear, concise and valid information that they can trust, as you mentioned, but also have the time so they can then innovate and think differently. And if we dumb things down so much, we may not have the people to be able to innovate because they, they can't think outside the box, so to speak. So that's something we got to work on as an AI device that's, uh that tolerates or in fact encourages innovation. I'll think yeah. about that. That'll be interesting. Yeah. So, so our audience is, is, you know, they're in the profession of digital enterprises. They hear all these words about uh, digitalization and so on. And I know you and I've talked about it in the past about, well, did digital happen to make PLM or did PLM enable digitalization? And I actually think it's getting really confusing again because there's so many words out there. Um, What's your view? Which, which came first or, or maybe we're talking about it wrong? Well, it, it varies by company, what they even think digitalization is. I, I kind of look at digitalization as two aspects. One is creating information or having information in a digital form. So it's not just on a piece of paper, but it's in digital form and hopefully is managed. It has context. You can have associations between it. That's kind of the starting point. I think the bigger value in digital information is how you use that information, is the, the mm -hmm. business models you can enable by using information as core value or core assets to the business. And most businesses don't do that. I mean, they, some talk about it, and you certainly have examples for years like power by the hour in the aircraft industry where they're selling power of the, the engine and they have to be smart about that information set and be able to be proactive in how they maintain it and do other things with that information so that they can sell the power and not just worry about the thing they deliver to the market itself. So I think there's a couple of things going on here that are really causing people to maybe think differently. And some of it goes back to the dot com, dot com era where, oh, it's all about information. Well, it's always been about information, right? At the end of the day, the product and services that someone delivers to the market is a result of the information set. So, so in that regard, PLM professionals have always been about digitalization, but digitalization of product information which is not mm -hmm. everything a business needs. So on one hand, yes, I think we've been there, you know, PLM professionals have been there since the beginning of digitalization or creating digital information, digital models, you know, math models and other things we've talked about for, for decades now. It, but it's not the whole digitalization because really it's about not just digitalization of information and processes, but also using that information to drive value within the organization and ultimately value to the customer. And that, PLM has been associated with, but not really directly leading. So I, I, I like your point about value to the customer. Um, maybe I would propose that instead, it, you know, the last few decades have been about value to the shareholder. 
right? How do we make manufacturing more efficient? Well, we should stop doing drawings and we should make it digital and all this stuff. Bringing the next upgrade to a customer that they're willing to pay for, which may not mean manufacture anything new. It may just mean a new feature capability, if you will, into an existing, you know, I came out of the car business into an existing car. Well, for sure, PLM and digital technologies could help with that. But those data models that were created to streamline manufacturing probably aren't the same data models you need to do an upgrade in your your phone. I mean, upgrades in phones happen all the time. People don't even know it anymore. Um, imagine the same thing on any device that has a computer in it, from a car to an airplane to those those guys doing jet engines, right? Um, so I, I think part of this uh, problem is maybe also the data model is expanding rapidly, or it should be but it has to be consistent with the other stuff so that you can take advantage of, of field data and put it back in the context of engineers that might just do an upgrade for you know, a feature set. Um, do you see um, anything that's needed in terms of standards or in terms of practices that would get people further down this road to this more whole life cycle data model? I, I, first thing I would just suggest, everyone needs to step back for a second and say, mm. what are we trying to accomplish as a business and what is the information needed to support that business construct? And, and the construct can change, right? The vision and right. mission of the business can change over time. So you know, I look at corporate data models and corporate process models as something that should be under change control and should be managed from the, the vision of the company all the way down. Most companies, I'm sure your experience has been, my experience just doesn't happen, at least not on a consistent basis. So that's, so that's one aspect before, forget about standards. If you're not even doing that, I don't care what the standards are. The next thing is, yeah, standards in a way that one, as a company, I know how to capture that information in a consistent manner that allows it to be managed. So it's always, and I, I like using the CM2 term or phrase, clear, concise, and valid, because that information needs to be trustworthy. So clear, mm -hmm. you understand it the same way I do. You know, valid, I can use it to make decisions. So, and you know, it's you know, clear, concise, and everything I need, nothing more, nothing less. But I have to be able to manage it in that context. So again, I understand its use, I understand how I can actually use it, when I can use it, what structures can I use it in, and then how do I manage it gets into the standards, right? The structures of information. And there's lots of standards, good news, bad news, there, there's lots of standards. Mm -hmm. You have some there, you know, very focused, like you know, the AP 242, for example, and then PLCS, uh, 239 and other things out there that are a little bit more holistic, but they're even components either of the life cycle or various components of the digital representation of, of the physical product, but not everything else that goes around it because the product exists. Well, again, I'm going to go back to what I said before. The product is a result of the information set, but there's a bunch of other decisions that the product doesn't know about. It's just a result of those decisions, which you need to have that information set as well or that understanding. So, oh, I made that decision because at that time I did not have, that material was too expensive. So I decided not to buy that material right. or I didn't have the manufacturing capabilities for that other material. So I've decided to do X or even though Y was better. And, but you know, two years from now, it could be totally different, but I have to mm -hmm. understand that as well. Yeah. So, so I, I, I want to wrap up with your closing thoughts on the pace of change. There's, I mean, computers continue to just amaze all of us how how we can do different things with them. Uh, sometimes maybe we are wasting our time with them and games and all the rest. But but that aside, do you think the pace of change is going to continue to accelerate, or 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 will something else happen? Well, we live in a, a demand society. Most most of the world, I mean, pretty much all the world is demand society, where you have you know the people that want to buy stuff want it want it done faster, they want it done cheaper, and they want more capabilities. I don't think pers you know, human nature is going to change. So I think that's kind of the fundamental okay. you know, underpinning of that. Because I've never seen someone go, oh, I'm okay with I bought the car from last year or the, whatever it might be, right? Any kind of product. I want it faster, I want it cheaper, and I want it better. At least perception of those things at, at a minimum. Right. So I think that drives things in itself to, to be able to do that. And then you, this faster and this cheaper and it's higher quality. I mean, all those things say, oh, how do I do it better then? How do I design mm -hmm. it better? Uh, and then that goes into simulation. It goes into changing, you know, going into simulation-driven systems development because I got more complex products that have you know, so many different disciplines. And I'll give an example, which is real interesting. A, a client we're working with recently um, make very complex um, 
immersive experiences. I'll, I'll just leave it like that. They have over 120 disciplines that they have to coordinate and collaborate to produce what they deliver to their customers. Hmm. And you know, most companies, you know, five or six disciplines is about it. This is a hundred, literally 120. And again, if I start going into, it, we may know who it is. So I'll, I'll leave that out. But that's the kind of complexity that some companies have to deal with. And most, most have to deal with a lot more complexity than they had before and really do a systems of systems approach. And when I talk about systems of systems, it's okay, what products do I bring to the market? Which products do I bring to what markets? What manufacturing capabilities do I have? And that's a whole systems in, in itself. Right. What logistics do I use? And then of course the product is very complex as well. So speed is gonna increase. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't see that, I don't see it slowing down. I may not speed up a lot, but it's, it's already pretty high right now. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, a lot for all of us to think about in the digital enterprise society. Tom, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Hey, Peter. So I listened to what you guys were talking about, and there was a lot of discussion about trends, about change, about opportunity. Let's mm -hmm. take this back to the person who's listening to this podcast. A lot of them are practitioners trying to build a career here in this mm -hmm. PLM space. What does all this mean for the, the, the regular person who's out there doing their job? How, how can they take all that you just talked about and help them devise a plan for how to grow a career? That's, that's an excellent question because you got the tactical stuff right stuff that you're given to do and then how do you become one better in the job you have but also look at how do you expand your your skills and knowledge so one of the things that you know we'll look for from a plm pro professional is continue to rethink how do you fit and your part of the life cycle fits into the bigger picture sometimes that's very frustrating because you see a much bigger picture you know it better than maybe anyone else in the organization but you're stuck in doing a, let's say a silo piece but there's other companies that are just seeing it much broader, so there are other opportunities. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, stay up to date, right? You know, go to the events, listen to the podcast, you know, read the materials. There's a lot of material out there that's going on. Make sure you're talking to the right people within your own organization. Uh, there, there's lots of training and other things that can be done as well to help you continue to round out your capabilities to become smarter. I think, for example, an engineer that's a mechanical engineer only, and that's all they know, they have limited time left. They're going to have to understand the context of what they do within the context of other things, other disciplines uh, that are in their organization or potentially other organizations. So anything that helps them broaden out where they sit within the, the design value chain, so to speak, from a life cycle perspective is going to help them do their, be their job better, but also be more valuable to their, their own bosses, but also to potentially other opportunities in the future. Yeah, I definitely think that, uh, you know, like you said, looking within their organization and, and beyond, one of the things uh, Digital Enterprise Society recently lost, launched a mentor-mentee program. Mm -hmm. How important do you think it is for people who work in this space to, to find a mentor, whether it's someone in their company or maybe just within the industry? Well, I think that's actually wonderful to do because learning and understanding in the broad sense is difficult by yourself. Uh, so the more that you can you know, contact and be part of people that have had many different experiences that more powerfully can be. And I had um, you know, a, a very lucky opportunity when I joined General Motors, I was within a development program that put us in many different locations and different responsibilities. And there's still companies that do that. And that's really, to me, was really valuable. And I still see that being valuable to people because they see a bigger picture. I happen to have a, a master's in manufacturing systems engineering. So it's the manufacturing as a system of systems. So anytime you get to look beyond, you know, just turning a bolt, so to speak, or designing a bolt or just kind of the day-to-day -day stuff and you can look beyond of the system of systems that wrap around you, the smarter you're gonna be, the more value that you, that you offer. And having a mentor that can help you into finding those different things out and give you guidance on how to do that can be really, I mean, it's priceless in my opinion. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your information and your guidance today here on the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. We appreciate you, Peter Bellello from SimData, for being with us today. And uh, thank you to everybody who, who joined us because every single week, we really look to bring you thoughts, ideas, and information from in and around the product lifecycle management. The Digital Enterprise Society is the place for the exchange of ideas around the digital manufacturing tools. Check us out at digitalenterprisesociety.org. You've been listening to the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. Learn more about what you've heard here today at digitalenterprisesociety.org. Join us again next week.